All right, it's all about Dr. Kim Williams, so I'm just going to introduce him and get off stage because very excited to have uh, such a prominent cardiologist. I also will say longtime friend. I trained in the mid-1980s in Dallas, Texas and became a nuclear cardiologist, and every paper I read was by a Kim Williams, MD, and he was a few years ahead of me and started seeing him in meetings, and uh, it's just great to circle back a few times in our careers. Dr. Williams was born in Chicago, trained at the University of Chicago, ran down to Atlanta for a few years to become an internal medicine resident. Back to Chicago, he has more board certifications in internal medicine cardiology, nuclear cardiology, nuclear medicine, and CT imaging, became chief. And then we had him in Detroit for three years, 2010 to 2013, as a named professor and chief of medicine at Wayne State. Chicago had a hold on him, so he went back in 2013 as the chairman of cardiology and professor at James Herrick, professor, if I got that right, I think. Yes, sir, James Herrick, uh, important historical figure in the history of acute myocardial infarction heart attacks. But uh, we have him on the plant-based team. We have him in Detroit. Uh, he has frequent visits here because of some family ties, which uh, we're always excited about. And I'm going to turn it over. If you don't know, the immediate past president of the American College of Cardiology. So literally last year oversaw all legislative and administrative activities for the many thousands of cardiologists really around the world, but particularly in uh, the North American continent and now the immediate past president. So not just any guy coming to talk to us. So give up a big Detroit hoop and holler. Hoop and holler. Hoop, 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 hoop. Oh, you're good there. And you're good there. Good. Okay. You're good. Thank you, Joel. You, you're, that was a wonderful introduction, but you really should be talking more about you and all the things that you've accomplished as a, a converted interventional cardiologist. And uh, uh, it's really been great to see your uh, transition over time to uh, really spending much more time fixing um, the problem before it actually happens. So I'm pleased to be here, and uh, I do have a, a very uh, sad part of that introduction. Uh, I'd like to say it probably took about two minutes. That would be about three cardiovascular deaths in the United States. And this is something that we've been dealing with for a long time. Uh, does anybody in the audience know the trivia uh, question, uh, answer? When was the last time that heart disease was not the number one killer of Americans? Anybody? Anybody? Never. Spanish flu epidemic at the end of World War I. The most horrific flu ever. You know, the flu usually has a U-shaped mortality curve, infants, children, and then elderly people. This one had a W-shaped curve. If you had a good immune system, your immune system attacked you. That's what it took to knock heart disease out of the number one position, and it's been there ever since. Uh, if you are interested in it, you'll, you'll be surprised to see that even though it's still number one, it's been taking a hit. And uh, every time the doctor, Dr. Khan put in a stent in an artery or we gave a statin to a patient, we've actually gotten to the point where uh, we've actually had about a over 50% decrease in cardiac mortality over the last 40 years. And as you can look and see, well, what is it that we did that was so good? Uh, how about statins? How about defibrillators? Bypass surgery? On and on and on. But what have we really missed? Uh, well, we've missed the fact that at some point, if people get old enough, since the mortality of human life is 100% anyway, at some point, right? You will catch up. And so it's interesting that last year was the, was the year that, we, that uh, everything sort of got to the, the bottom and then it started to go up again. So this number, 167.1, will always be emblazed in my brain uh, because the next year, 2015, it was actually 168.5. And so we have hit a nadir, and we are starting to go up again. And so this whole idea of coming up with new, and I should say, 2013 through 2016 had some amazing uh, revolutionary treatments in cardiology. You know, you probably hear that we put in aortic valves through the leg now, and we give these fancy, very expensive cholesterol medicines that you can inject twice a, a month, and they take, take your cholesterol extremely down, and 
decrease heart attacks and, and strokes. Well, at some point, we have to get over the fact that we're just treating the disease and not preventing it. And so I always like to sh show some form of this slide. We're, bus we're busy mopping up the floor when we're not turning off the faucet. And so the fact that uh, the, the, the faucet is overflowing now faster than we can uh, mop it up uh, is a reality. Okay. So I do this in every audience. I take a little uh, poll of the audience just to see w what we have. And I suspect we're gonna do pretty good here today based on the, this, the fact that you are in a, uh, a, a plant-based uh, nutrition support group. But if you haven't gone through this with your family, if you have never heard of it, never gone through it with your family, please Google it. it came from the American Heart Association, but compiling a lot of data. It's so-called Life Simple 7. And so the question for you is, how many of us exercise every day, have our weight at the ideal body weight or less, we know what our cholesterol is and it is totally controlled, we do not smoke, we eat a heart-healthy diet, which I would define based on the literature that I'm gonna go through in a bit, as a plant-based diet, the blood pressure is normal or well-controlled, and no diabetes or blood sugar controlled. Okay, so, so if we, show of hands, how many people here are seven out of seven? And so it's, it's interesting that it looks like a handful of people, but I guarantee you that that's 10 times more than any meeting I've ever been at. So give yourselves a hand, okay? <laughs> if you ask all Americans, it's 3% that actually do all seven. And it's interesting that we're, you know, all of our therapies and all of the king's horses and men can't put this country back together. It's not just the United States problem. Um, you know, Dr. Khan mentioned the fact that the American College of Cardiology has members all over the world. We do. And so I had to, as president, get more and more into this and really talk with the Chinese about smoking cessation and mostly in men. In Brazil, it's heart failure. They have people dropping with heart failure uh, right on the street, and they have a whole program what to do. We do, uh, you know, CPR, and, and they're figuring out how to, how to put tourniquets on people. Um, there's a lot, of, a, a lot of disease, a lot of cardiovascular disease around the world, and it's growing. Um, so these figures from 2012 have been exceeded now, and probably the, the, the most concerning is the fact that so many of the deaths are in low and middle income countries. So we've got to change. Now, can we change uh, someone's culture? Can we change the business models? Uh, can we change the risk factors? Well, uh, if you were following the news a couple weeks ago at the American College of Cardiology, there was a wonderful presentation about a particular group of people who actually have naturally uh, grown up having very little animal products in their diet. And you look at the amount of heart disease they had and it's almost absent. And so it's a lesson for us all around the world. This is in Bolivia. Uh, this, they're called Simanis. And the Shimani people uh, actually do mostly this. They're one plant after another. They have nothing against animals. If they can catch them and kill them and eat them, they, they, they will do that but the frequency is actually far less, and so they are predominantly a plant-based culture. And this is what was presented at the ACC meeting, that you had a group of people whose risk factors were almost non-existent, and when you looked, uh, other than the fact that uh, all the ones at the bottom, the things that you've probably never seen, everybody's seen blood sugar and cholesterol and everything, um, body mass index being more than 30, hardly anyone, um, the stuff at the bottom there, that's all evidence of infection, and they do get a lot of parasites. They don't have clean water or stuff like that. Okay. But they did CAT scans on the people, and what they were able to find is that most of the patients, the overwhelming majority, had no calcium in their arteries. Calcium is a great marker for um, the presence of coronary heart disease, and it predicts how much you have, predicts whether or not you're going to have heart attack and cardiovascular problems, including cardiovascular death. So very few people had large amounts. Um, if you look at, even as, at age 80, most of them have, have no coronary calcium. And if you were to sort of age them out based on their calcium scores, they were 
coming in at about 28 years younger than the average American. So it's, it's a good lesson. We've had a lesson that, went, that I think is even more impressive, and that is starting from a really bad spot and then changing things. And that happened in Finland. And so back in the 70s, when I was in medical school, the number one country for, uh, for heart disease was actually Finland. We would always joke, don't go over there, that's where the finish line is. <laughs> yeah. And so the fact of the matter is, there was a lot of uh, animal products. Um, and the cholesterols were high, blood pressures were high, a lot of smoking, and they went on a, a rampage to try to change that. Change the, the intake of dairy. So this is a, a graph showing butter uh, consumption and how it dramatically, with, uh, with public service announcements and people uh, pressuring each other to change their diet, they actually dropped uh, dairy consumption. That ultimately dropped cholesterol the serum cholesterol uh, came down very nicely, and that resulted in a, about a 50% decrease in cardiovascular death. More cereal, more vegetables, more fruits, more berries, less dairy, less meat, and less smoking. So it actually does work. People can change. We just have to have the motivation uh, to do it. I'll get back to that in a bit. So, uh, so are there other places around the world? I'd love to talk about the blue zones. Most of you have heard about this, so I won't spend too much time talking about it. Just make a couple of points that if you want to live to be 100, you should do the things that these folks do, like in Okinawa. Very little meat, dairy, refined sugar, and much more in the way of beans, vegetables. Uh, and it does result directly in less obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular mortality. We actually have learned a lot from one of these blue zones, and that's Loma Linda, um, because there's a lot of data that's come out of there that I'll share with you. And, but we have some good life habits, like not eating till you're full. If we could get everyone in the United States to understand that, it would re decrease our health care costs tremendously. Eating the small meal in the in, uh, smallest meal of the day in the late afternoon or evening, mostly plants, especially beans, and not uh, eating animal products very often. Talking about the, uh, the Loma Linda, there's a high prevalence of Seventh-day Adventists. Do we have any Seventh-day Adventists here? Just, just a couple, okay? We would give you a big hand, but I tell you, it's, a, it's an important um, uh, epidemiologic, uh, and do you fill out the, the surveys, by the way? You do? Okay. <laughs> That's not me. Does that, does that mean get off the stage? No. <laughs> okay. All righty. Okay. So let's talk about those food surveys they do. Um, they, they express a religious preference for ovo-lacto-vegetarian. Uh, that's the way I learned it. They say it the other way around. Um, but, and that's, so that's a high number of folks who do that. But they're Americans, so there's a lot of people on the standard American diet. Then there's those who sort of halfway in between, they cut down on the standard American diet. There's those who eliminate all the mammals and eat only fish and dairy. And then um, a fair number of people who do follow that lacto-ovo-vegetarian. Then since they have a large following in Southern California, you have a, a number of vegans, people who don't eat any animal products whatsoever. The nice part about it is they, they do the questionnaires and they don't throw you out of the congregation if you don't follow what they say, right? And so we get data like this, and Gary Fraser is their lead author. Uh, talking with him, he just loves the fact that not everybody does the same thing, and so you can compare groups. And so if you compare body mass index, um, a lot of them in Southern California, it's not a very obese state, uh, but it, the less animal products you eat, the less uh, obesity you have, the less diabetes, the less hypertension. And in, in fact, lowering 20, 25 percent with each step along the way. So, you know, that age-old question that I know other animal rights people like it, but the age-old question, if I just change a little, will it help? Well, the answer is yes. And then you, have, you get to choose how much mortality you're going to have, okay? And so, <clears throat> but uh, you actually can do tremendously better just by reducing um, the, the amount of animal products that you're eating. Okay. But people will say, you know, is there any correlation between those risk factors, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and dying? And they, so they did uh, publish Adventist Health Study Number 2, 
that talk specifically about mortality patterns, and you could see, particularly in men, about a 30% decrease in ischemic heart disease, meaning heart attacks, where your arteries are plugged up with the plaque. Um, and it actually uh, lowers all-cause mortality. Uh, now, don't, I don't know that it means that people who are vegetarian wear their seat belts more often. Could be. Um, but I suspect it has a lot to do with diet and a lot of other diseases other than the heart disease I'm talking about tonight. Let me talk to you about blood pressure. Okay, I won't do a poll of the audience of how many people had high blood pressure at one point, but it's pretty high. Um, and if somebody tells you that you need a bunch of pills, you probably do. But while you're getting on those pills and getting the blood pressure down, change the diet so that you don't uh, end up on those pills for long periods of time. <clears throat> less expense, less side effects. Let's do this with lifestyle. So this is showing you a graph that you can't see, but you can see those dots. And all the dots on the left side are saying that you, the study that looked at diet with more plant-based diet, more vegetarian diet, a wide variety of types of vegetarian diet, uh, all, mostly all of them reduced the blood pressure. Uh, if you had to go with the best studies, it would be the largest ones, the longest term, and completely vegan and ending up with substantial reductions in blood pressure. So let's, let's try that. We have very clear evidence, uh, and you could you know, mention it to your physician, mention it to all, the physician of a family member who has the uh, blood pressure, because it's a really underutilized treatment for high blood pressure. Uh, what, what is it about it? They ask you, well, why? <clears throat> you can tell them it's that vegetables have a lot of glutamic acid. Glutamic acid is a uh, amino acid in vegetable protein. I know some people don't even think vegetables have protein, but we'll talk about that in a bit, too. Um, and and uh, a lot of whole grains. People who are eating a plant-based diet tend to eat a fair no amount of whole grains, and when you do, that lowers your blood pressure, both the upper number, systolic, and the lower number, the diastolic. And so I'd like to focus on that because of this, okay? Um, I, especially after the travel ban, I would suspect that almost everyone here is an American because no one else can get in, okay? <laughs> And if we look at the percent of the gross domestic product of the United States that's being taken up by health care, and right now we're uh, ap approaching 11 percent, it's estimated that it's going to continue to grow, and it's going to grow dramatically because of our successes, putting aortic valves in instead of uh, saying, you know, you're too sick for surgery, so, you know, we're, we're going to call the hospice. Uh, you put on a valve through the leg and people will live a few more uh, great years, right? But it's expensive as people, uh, as they grow older, not dying and not healthy. And so the ex excess cost growth, by the time uh, many of us are ready for retirement, uh, there's not going to be a lot of uh, you know, access to uh, government health care if we don't do something about this. The, the cost to Medicare is tremendous. So, if I pick out the top three costs, uh, and you could actually go down uh, after number four, which, and then do number five and number six, number seven, almost all of them, I know it starts to sound like Michael Greger, but the um, fact of the matter is, almost all of the things that Medicare is paying for uh, have good data that they are related to the diet. But let's focus on hypertension, because that's what we're talking about for a minute. 58% of all Medicare beneficiaries are actually hypertensive. And so the, the, what are they spending money on? Well, there was an article that described it exactly. Uh, and they're talking about strokes, hospitalizations, um, medications, and heart failure, kidney failure, all related to hypertension. So they estimate that about 30% of all Medicare costs are due to hypertension, $130 billion a year. If you were to push that forward when we're expecting to spend about a trillion dollars a year just very soon in 2020, that's almost $300 billion, okay? That is education for inner city kids, it's roads, it's uh, infrastructure for the country that we are spending on a totally unnecessary disease. So, I want everybody to go find somebody who's not plant-based and tell them that it is their patriotic duty <laughs> to change their diet. All right. Do it for yourself. Do it for your family. Do it for your country. All right. So you got that on film, right? <laughs> okay. Um, 
Let's talk a little bit about dietary calories. <clears throat> Speaks for itself. Got this from the Center from Disease, for Disease Control a few, uh, a few days ago. It's, uh, or maybe I got it from Joel Kahn, actually. <laughs> so, so, or maybe I tweeted it out when I got it. But it's this, it's this pretty uh, impressive. Uh, most of us aren't old enough to remember those little tiny burgers, but I certainly do. And it's nothing like what it was in the 50s and 60s. The calorie density, people aren't familiar with the idea that you've got a stomach, and the stomach wants to be full, and when you fill your stomach, that's pretty much when you stop eating. And if you're doing that with fat, um, then you're not filling your stomach very, up very much, and you're going to eat more and more and more. If you're doing it with meat products, 400 calories of oil, 400 calories of beef, you're still not very full. If you do it with, with vegetables, you may end up in the bathroom, like, uh, <laughs> like the joke was, but uh, that's all a very positive thing. It improves your colon health. Well, the fact of the matter is we have to learn that you know, meat kills, processed meat, meat kills you faster, and as McDougall likes to say, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. Uh, I, I'm going to show you a little bit later that mm, the uh, sugar you eat is the fat you wear as well, but um, that's the subject for a few slides from now. So I, I like to talk about this study because it was published uh, just a few months ago, and it caught my attention that a lot of what we do in plant-based nutrition has a lot of biochemical, wonderful stuff, but maybe what we're doing is just cutting the calories, and that is m making a significant improvement. So uh, this one caught my eye. Um, very nice study where they actually looked at taking normal people who were not overweight and changing their diet. They did a randomized trial and everything, and, and they did this for two years. People lost about 10% of their weight with, by just restricting the calories. But what they didn't expect was, was all these little tiny graphs. I'm just going to show you two of them. Number one, their mood improved. So the answer to the old age-old question, I, th I think it's uh, Dean Ornish who likes to say it, am I going to live longer or is it just going to seem like it? Not, not eating all this wonderful stuff that I'm going to have to give up. Uh, well, the fact of the matter is the mood is actually better when you eat less. And this one, for all the guys, was pretty amazing. That, that sexual function showed a dramatic improvement, just not eating as much food. Okay, so I'm going to switch from quantity of food to talking about what it is that we eat, and I'll spend most of the time talking about that. And this one uh, is a... If very interested. If you're interested in the science of diet, you probably ought to look at the Regards Trial website. They were supposed to be looking at racial differences in stroke, uh, but they did get uh, that's geographic and racial differences, and they actually were able to find just what we knew, and that is the Southern diet that has a lot of fat, a lot of fried foods, a lot of putting neck bones in the in the collard greens, that sort of thing ends up causing uh, an increase in mortality. That survival probability that you're seeing here over time, this is a so-called Kaplan-Meier plot, and the red line goes down, 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 faster than all the other American diets, none of which are healthy uh, necessarily, but not as bad as this particular diet. And so that southern diet has been associated with 56% higher risk of heart disease, 50% increase in kidney disease, and higher risk of stroke as well. So we've got to change people's culture uh, so that they're not holding their hearts hostage anymore. Had to throw this one in here because it was just published a few days ago, talking about dietary factors. And it's a very insightful study, um, talking about you know, the correlation between death from heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes. Okay? And it looks like a complicated graph, but not really. It's showing you that oh, you're getting a whole lot of mortality, and they've broken it down based on men and women, but they're saying, here are the things that we think make you die. Having high sodium in your diet, more than 2,000 milligrams. So it turns out the American Heart Association, at least by this study, was correct. They were saying, oh, no more, no more than 1,800 milligrams a day. Uh, having not enough nuts and seeds, having high processed red meat, having, this one was strange, low seafood. We already saw that pesco vegetarians do better but they're not as good as vegans, so why does this come up that if you are not eating very much, you die faster? That is what I call a substitutionary benefit. That is, if you stop eating mammals uh, and start eating fish, your mortality goes down. That's the, simply, uh, that's, that actually was seen and shown very well in the Mediterranean diet studies, two large randomized trials. 
It's not as good as plant-based, but if you're going to compare with American diet, it's tremendously better. Yes, sir. You want to So let me back up one and say, would you really need to? Is there, are, is there really randomized trial evidence that you need omega-3s? So far, we have a little bit of data on cognitive impairment. We have a little bit of data on triglycerides. If you are a person with really high triglycerides, the fish oils can actually help. But if you're doing everything else right, you probably are not going to benefit from them. We had multiple randomized trials. Uh, trying to prevent heart attacks, prevent rhythm disturbances. There was a little data on that for a while. The randomized trials, they actually didn't work. So I'm not a big fan of, of omega-3s the way that they're given. And so I'd like to see you know, more of the plant-based omega-3s that people say don't exist, they actually do. You'd like to see a good randomized trial. So the omega-3s omega that I'm referring to were from algae. Mm-hmm. All, all I need is a randomized trial, and it'll make, end up on a slide. <laughs> all right, fantastic. Okay, so um, uh, low amount of vegetables, low fruits, just what you would think. High sugar sweetened beverages, how about that one? Low whole grains, um, having uh, more saturated fat rather than polyunsaturated fat, high red meat. So we've got, uh, you could break it down by men and women and correlate the, exactly what uh, results in, in uh, in mortality, and it really is very insightful. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, I would say that it, uh, it's worthwhile looking at it. Uh, they tried breaking it down in terms of uh, uh, race, how much, uh, how much education, et cetera, and these, these, ten, these trends tend to hold true. Diet results in death. So let's look at one of those components, and that's sugar, okay? It's, uh, long known that if you're eating a lot of sugar, you will increase your weight, you will uh, end up with insulin resistance, you will end up with all the, the coronary risk factors and produce a lot of plaque in your arteries. But you're also, as you're increasing your weight, you're increasing the, the insulin resistance even more, so you need more and more and you become diabetic. Well, the fact of the matter is that insulin is a growth hormone and when you have high levels, you are going to develop plaque and more uh, hypertension, et cetera, including uh, more obesity. Well, we've known for quite a while that sugar is bad for you. Uh, probably one of the first shots over the bow was uh, the Nurses' Health Study. This was published in 2010, so this is seven years ago, the competing risks analysis and that actually looked at uh, a glycemic load, meaning a lot of sugar in your meal. And the point estimate of a 22% increase in death was actually a little bit higher than eating cholesterol, which comes along with an animal product. So sugar, not good. Uh, cereal fiber, really good for you. Okay. Then we had this one a few years later uh, that actually looked very carefully at how much uh, added sugar intake people were doing and their ultimate cardiovascular death. That would be heart attack, stroke, heart failure. And there's this nice curvilinear relationship between sugar consumption and death. And so I think there are a lot of vegans who say, if it's, if it's, as long as it grows in the ground, it's okay. And I say that's mostly true, but there are some things that grow in the ground that you probably don't want, poison mushrooms, things like that. And indeed, uh, and certainly not sugar, added sugar. We have data that it increases diabetes and just two, I mean, how many of us take two soda pops at the same time? You do that, you're, incre you're increasing your risk of diabetes by about 20%, so let's, let's not do that. Uh, that's, I'm sorry, each serving. Uh, and then there was this. So I, I kind of joke with my cardiology fellows that if you're ever gonna do something really nefarious, destroy the paperwork. So having a graduate student come by and uh, you know, come by your office after you passed away, and you used to be the chair of the nutrition department at Harvard, and you struck a deal for money with the Sugar Research Foundation to shift the blame uh, from sugar to saturated fat. Well, uh, it's an unfortunate uh, piece of history. All my Harvard colleagues are very embarrassed by it. Uh, we we'll ex expect academia to have integrity, but these things do happen, I guess. Anyway, we had data for quite a while that said that is sugar and saturated fat were about the same in terms of mortality. This is actually the accompanying editorial, and that's very clear that if you look at them side by side, 
they pretty much track with each other. You are in the United States eating a lot of both, Japan eating very little of both, saturated fat and sugar lead to heart disease. Okay, so let's talk about saturated fat. Is that how you spell that? Oh, that's how you spell it, okay. So we've actually had uh, this data for a while, largely ignored, except by plant-based nutrition folks, that if you, when you eat a, fat, a fatty meal, your blood vessels become poorly functional. This is a fancy test called a flow meter. It's actually not a fancy test. All you do is put a tourniquet around an arm, squeeze it until the living daylights are gone out of it, and then let it go and, the, and see how fast the blood goes. And that's, uh, that flow reactivity uh, or vascular reactivity test will tell you how good your arteries are functioning. I mean, you're doing it in your forearm, but it's the same thing's happening in your brain and your heart everywhere else. When you eat a fatty American meal, the function of those arteries and their ability to carry blood flow goes down dramatically, almost a 50% decrease, and it stays down for a while. And it'll come up gradually, and then you eat another American meal. Not a good idea, right? Okay. So we've had this, so that was all suggestive that bad things were going to happen, but we were lacking until recently really clear data on, on saturated fat and coronary heart disease. That was published just a few months ago in the British Medical Journal. And just always wonder about that because it's about United States men and women. So why did it get published in Great Britain? I wonder how many journals rejected it because they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to change their diet. Okay. All right. Bottom line from this was higher intakes of um, uh, saturated fatty acids are associated with the increase in coronary disease just as one would have expected. Let me switch over to talk about the high protein diet because that's something, so we could, we could do a little bit of confession in a support group, right? How many people here actually tried the Atkins diet? So, how about that? So people have, all right? So you can close your eyes for this part, <laughs> all right? All right, so that's uh, Robert Atkins uh, before he passed away of what uh, some people say was actually coronary heart disease, head trauma after arrhythmia, well, um, they go through that in the courts because um, people like this young lady who had a dramatic improvement in her, out, in her weight, um, it, it, a lot of people who did this lost a lot of weight and then had some problems. And so the, I think the first study that I saw about this was published 10 years ago. And so I don't know what the status of any of those lawsuits were. They're saying that he knew that it could cause heart disease. He knew that it, it could increase mortality, but kept pushing it anyway. Um, if all he has to do is put a couple of disclaimers in the book, which I haven't, I didn't read them, um, and you could probably get away with it, but the, what everyone should know, if you know anyone who's doing this, they should know that it increases mortality. So this one 10 years ago said there was a 22% increase in mortality. And then this one from the American Heart Association uh, looked at the high, uh, the low carbohydrate, which is a, a nice way of saying high protein diet. And they were able to dissect out plant versus animal sources. And uh, it turns out that if you're a heart attack survivor, now obviously that's an enriched population for having events. They're heart attack survivors, right? So the numbers are going to be a little higher. So all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, 30% uh, increase and 53% increase, okay? So anyone who's had a heart attack, please steer them away from the Atkins diet, but not only that, let them know that if you really want to lose weight and you want to do a high protein diet and you're doing vegetable protein, it's not a problem. But remember, vegetable protein doesn't exist, right? Okay, so, all right. Um, so what was wrong with the Atkins diet? Probably this. This was published in 2012, uh, a study that looked at red meat consumption and mortality, concluding that red meat consumption increases risk of total cardiovascular and cancer deaths. And it's interesting that um, they looked particularly at substitutionary benefit, all right? Uh, they showed that there is an increment. The more times you, per day you eat animal products, the more, uh, particularly red meat, the more you die, okay? <laughs> and they, they showed what has become really a catchphrase for a lot of us, that red meat kills, processed red meat kills you faster, okay? And that if you were to substitute other things, some of them that might not even be healthy for you, like poultry, but it's so much better than red meat. Uh, but nuts, beans, those would be really good substitutes, not associated with increasing uh, bad outcomes. 
I had to throw this one in here because we do have a lot of people in the United States having heart failure. Heart failure is a growing problem, and it turns out there's an article, again, largely ignored, that says that it's really related to how much processed and unprocessed red meat you eat, particularly processed red meat, um, where it increases heart failure incidence um, uh, by 28% and more heart failure mortality by, you know, factor of 2.4 through that's 243%. I mean, so it's really not a small effect. Every person in every heart failure clinic should be talking about not eating red meat, certainly not eating processed red meat. Okay, this one's new. Uh, this article took, uh, I think, everybody by storm. All the vegans were going like this. Okay, finally we've got a, a huge study that says that we were right. So this was, well, you might want to write this one down. It was uh, published last October in the Journal of American Medical Association, in JAMA Internal Medicine. And I tell you, it's, uh, it's, it really will change people. I end up, every new patient visit, I end up showing them this article. Right there, you know, that's, everybody rues the fact that the doctors have the electronic health records and you gotta sit there typing instead of talking to a patient and interacting with them. Well, I turn the screen, <laughs> okay? And we talk about a lot of uh, plant-based nutrition stuff and in my coaching, I throw this in here. Um, so it was a study that had hundreds of thousands of people doing food frequency surveys, and then uh, when they would die, they would add up all the, all the mortality and see what was causing the death. And this is what I show every patient. First of all, it actually explained why we were having so much trouble with the egg board saying that there's not a significant relationship between egg consumption and heart death. Well, if you look at their data, Eggs increase cardiac mortality by 12%, fish by 12%, dairy by 11%. But for the statisticians in the room, the confidence intervals cross one, which for the lay people in the room, that means you could say it's not significant. It may be real or it may not be real. Well, why would the confidence intervals be wider here than they are for the others? Well, the answer is right down here. Eggs cause so many cases of cancer death, more so than processed red meat, okay? And since dead people don't have heart attacks, you will decrease the number available to have the heart attacks, which widens your confidence intervals. That's a lot of heavy science, or statistical science, just to say that eggs are dangerous, cancer and heart disease, more than likely, heart disease, but who cares if, you know, you're not, you're not preventing heart attacks by cancer death. That's not what we're looking for. Um, but uh, the thing that we knew from all the other studies is that processed red meat is worse than red meat. Red meat is worse than poultry and fish, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's for the heart. If you look at all-cause mortality, a couple of interesting things. First of all, all of them reach statistical significance. All of them, every type of animal protein is associated with increasing mortality. Um, and, and if someone could explain this bottom curve to me, that'd be great. Um, how, why does processed red meat lead to other kinds of deaths? Is it suicide after you eat bacon? I, I don't know, uh, it's not, they don't go into it in the article, uh, but that is a big outlier. The, the, the biggest is non-cancer, non-cardiac, and eating, uh, eating processed red meat. So it's a good idea to not do that. Okay, so I would add the, um, the substitutionary benefit we were talking about with nuts. Nut consumption decreases uh, uh, mortality. Um, this using five servings per week. I know there are some vegan diets that don't use nuts, and you could make that argument, probably substitutionary benefit. When you, uh, people say, oh, you shan't, shouldn't eat nuts because it would increase your weight, because there's a lot of saturated. Yes, it is monounsaturated fat, but it is fat, and the fat you eat is the fat you well. Where? Well, actually, the nut consumption studies show that people, on average, lose a little bit of weight with nuts. Again, it's a substitutionary benefit. They start eating nuts, and they're not eating something else that would be much more damaging. So are nuts healthy? Who knows? All we know is that it's better than animals. Okay. All right. So um, I won't, won't want to spend talking too much biochemistry, but there are some things that you probably have heard of that you might want to know. One is, uh, how many of us have had our CRP level done? Quite, well, quite a number, okay? So we know that CRP actually is comparable to cholesterol, different uh, in terms of conferring risk. 
That is, if your CRP is low, C-reactive protein is low, and your LDL cholesterol is low, you have a good outcome over eight years. This is Paul Ritker's study from Harvard. If they're both high, you're in trouble. If you're, one's high, one's low, then you get sort of this intermediate result, okay? They also know how to treat it. It's with a statin. And I won't ask how many of you have taken a statin before, but um, you know, I, I like to tease people, or everyone complains about statins, they say you know, that uh, it has too many side effects. Eh, they do have side effects, mostly muscle aches, and about one-fifth of the people, eh, four-fifths of the people can take it, not a problem. So, but I tell them there is a big major side effect of statins, and that is breaking the Medicare trust fund, because people are not dead. And so they, they're pretty, but they don't, they're not healthy either, right? And so we've got to be able to do something different. But um, I would say that uh, there is really good data that statins for the people who particularly who have high C-reactive protein and LDL cholesterol, if I blow up this left-hand corner, you see that heart attack, stroke, and death going up on placebo, and this is what happens. Cut about 50% of it with a statin. Now, why is this plant-based guy talking about statins? Because we, we actually had this data. This is 2003, David Jenkins, the portfolio diet, where he did a randomized trial of a very low, un-American, I know David Jenkins is Canadian, so, but <laughs> un-American diet, low in saturated fat, milled whole wheat cereals, low fat dairy foods, um, that's the control group. Then you take that, another group with that same diet and you give them lovastatin, our original statin. And then you have another group where you don't do any of this animal products, you do completely vegan diet with a lot of plant sterols and you know, that's like black bean soup, soy protein, <coughs> Soy protein, viscous fibers, and almonds. You have to eat a handful of almonds three times a day, okay? And yes, it was sponsored by the California almond industry, but that's beside the point, okay? <laughs> okay. As it turns out, Oh, goodness. Did everybody pick up on the irony of that? The golden retriever needs a retriever? Okay, okay, that's not really like that. Okay. So anyway, back to plant sterols and, and almonds. Um, it's interesting that that C, that very dangerous C-reactive protein, which tells you about the amount of inflammation in your body, actually went down faster with the plant-based diet than it did with the statin. They did both come down. And the LDL cholesterol, they came down essentially the same. So we have a statin. You don't have to take a pill. You, we have a statin uh, for most people. And if you have critical disease, that's different. I'm all in favor of plant-based nutrition on top of statins and, and doing everything you can. Um, but we actually do have an anti-inflammatory, cholesterol-lowering diet that's available to everyone. OK, so I wanted to compare the uh, nut data uh, to the, the sort of the opposite, eating animal protein. Um, so I'm, a lot of people here saw forks over knives, and you probably saw the little mouse experiment. You give them cancer cells, and then you feed them animal uh, protein, and the cancer grows, and you stop it, and, and uh, give them plant protein instead, and the cancer starts to not grow so fast. And I think a lot of us looked at that and just kind of rolled our eyes and said, OK, well, that's great. I know it works for heart disease, but I'm not so sure about that cancer stuff. Well, a few years later, it was published in Cell Metabolism. It's one of the top journals in, in all of medicine. And they took the whole idea, took it apart, and showed that this is insulin-like growth factor. So that's a molecule you might want to remember. It's called IGF-1. Uh, anyone who has a kid who's doing um, weight training, trying to do bodybuilding, they sell this stuff at GNC, okay? Um, and it does make your muscles grow. And if you are uh, getting it out of animal protein, you actually are putting yourself at higher mortality, higher di diabetes, higher cancer rate. And you know, it is very true that and once you get above 65, you do need a lot of protein in your diet to decrease your mortality, but it ought to be plant-derived protein, lower mortality than with animal uh, products, and that probably is due to IGF-1. Okay, ready for a quiz? I don't know if, you know how many Larson fans you're, you, we have here, but 
If you can't see it in the back, it says, in sudden disgust, the three lionesses realized they had killed a Tufuda beast, one of the Serengetis of noxious health antelopes. <laughs> I get this question all the time. Where am I going to get my protein? And I finally got to the point where I just say, well, how do horses and ele ele elephants and cows get protein? They're mammals just like we are. If you feed them animal products, they get heart disease just like we do. And so uh, they get plenty big and they're not eating any animal stuff at all uh, under normal circumstances. And so, um, so then I d developed a little quiz, okay? So you ready? We can do a show of hands, okay? For every 100 grams of the following, which of these is correct? Number one, chicken is less than pork. Nobody cares. All right, good. I, I like that. All right. Beef is more protein than peanuts. No takers on that one? Okay. All right. Egg whites more than peanuts. Okay, I've got a handful on that one. Quinoa less than cashews. No? Yeah? All right. This is the answer I normally get. Okay. All right. That's the vast majority of physicians, including cardiologists. All right. So here's the list for you guys. Chicken, 31 grams per 100 grams. <clears throat> Pork is less than chicken. Beef, 26. Peanuts, 26. So it was a trick question. The answer is they're equal. All right. Uh, almonds uh, is next. Uh, cashews after that. Quinoa, less than cashews. And egg whites, the least. So all these people talking about, I got to have my egg whites for protein, not so much. Okay? All right. Okay. Let's talk about a couple more molecules and then uh, I'm just going to sum up. One is TMAO. Um, this is something that is, was popularized at the Cleveland Clinic a few years ago. Wonderful publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. I thought it was the most insightful graphic I had ever seen in the in EJM where they looked at an artery being blocked and hemorrhaged and heart, making a heart attack or stroke uh, or death and the meat, cheese, and eggs going in the mouth. I thought that was just perfect, all right? And, but they talk about the mechanism is you're taking these items that have dietary phosphatidylcholine. Um, if you really work at it, you can pronounce all these things, okay? And the, it will actually go into your gut and get metabolized into something called trimethylamine. That goes to your liver and it gets turned into trimethylamine oxide. A little easier to say TMAO. That TMAO is associated with each of these. Uh, it, so it's vasculotoxic is the term I would use. It ruins blood vessels, it makes plaque, and then makes those plaques angry, upset, have them break, and then clot on top of it. So uh, if you do uh, long-term outcome studies on a number of individuals and you look at their TMAO levels, the highest quartile has the highest rate of heart attack, stroke, and death. It's true of heart failure as well not just unprocessed red meat or processed red meat, if you have a high TMAO level from that diet, you are going to have a really bad outcome. And it has the, everybody has these little um, clotting elements in their bloodstream called platelets. And TMAO turns on your platelets, it makes you clot. So it's probably not something we all wanna do. So this is an interesting slide where they actually tried asking a vegan, and actually a handful of vegan, one to start off and then they did another four. Would you please eat a big steak? I don't think I would do it, <laughs> but uh, they did. And uh, what they found is that the rise in TMAO level after a steak that you see in an omnivore does not happen in the vegan. Well, why is that? It's that your, your bacteria in your gut do get changed. And I'm just talking about, I'm not just talking about going and getting fast food restaurant, getting a hamburger and getting E. coli toxicity. Uh, there probably are bacteria and uh, microbes that are in that food that are either coming in with the food or not being cleared by the plant-based nutrition. But the GI tract of vegans is completely different um, and they do not develop the, the high TMAO level. So it's something worth remembering. Another one that people uh, talk about a lot that they but uh, probably need uh, sort of re-education is heme iron. I would cover up the animal products as sources of iron with vegetables. And the reason to do that is the following. When you're eating iron from an animal source, the iron's pretty much in the blood. And that blood is so-called heme iron. Heme iron is, actually has an oxidation state that chemically changes your cholesterol, 
and sets up inflammation in your arteries, makes it more likely that you have heart attacks. And so it's really nice to have this data that's been out for over a decade now, uh, and it goes a long way to explain what we knew 25 years ago, again, from Finland, that the more iron you have in your body, the higher your heart attack rate is. And in fact, if you got your, uh, you measured your serum ferritin level, which tells you how much iron you have, uh, when you get above the upper limit of normal, that doubles your risk of a heart attack. So let's stay away from heme iron. So I know I've been talking about cardiovascular disease, I've been talking about um, you know, heart attack, stroke, death. And there are a wide variety of, uh, of health conditions that can be improved. This is just a very partial list uh, from a review a few years ago by Kate Marsh. And I, but one of the things that I think is at the top of that list is, that we don't talk about enough is regression of plaque. When people have coronary heart disease, carotid disease, any artery that's full of plaque, somebody should be talking to that patient about regressing that plaque, getting it to go away. And so you, hopefully you're all familiar with Caldwell Alciston and his uh, plant-based diet, which is very low, no fat. And this is probably one of the most famous angiograms in plant-based nutrition. Uh, he was at a American College of Cardiology and he did talk about this particular image. And so um, we got to hear that this was a 41-year-old physician. And there's hard plaque and there's soft plaque. And if you have mostly soft plaque, you are a candidate for sewing. I know where there's some fat. When you're not eating a, uh, much fat or any fat in your diet, your body can figure out where the fat is and go and get it, and got it right out of the artery. And that's, that's, I finally had a cogent explanation of this angiogram. I've obviously done thousands of angiograms and, and uh, never saw anything like this. And I've had people tell me, oh no, it's just spasm. That isn't real. Now, it really is real. It's resolution of plaque. And so he, he's shown it m multiple times. Dean Ornish has shown it with changes on an angiogram. Uh, the, most, the more you adhere to the uh, Ornish diet, and that's, again, plant-based with about 10% fat, all plant-based, okay? Um, but he, has, uh, uh, as Dr. Khan mentioned, we're both nuclear cardiologists, and so we love these nuclear pictures where you inject someone. Yeah, nuclear and medicine don't sound like they go together, but they really do, <laughs> okay? <laughs> You inject them with a tracer uh, that goes to the heart, and then you take a picture of the heart, and you find out where the blood flow went. It's actually a fairly simple technique. Um, you do a nice three-dimensional display. This, these, one, these are actually called PET scans. They're from the University of Texas. And you can, you know, anyone, um, a trained cardiologist or a trained mammal, could actually read this, <laughs> seeing the fact that uh, if you're in the blue, your blood flow is really bad. It's 50% or less. And that's what was going on with this particular person in the bottom wall of their heart. And without an angiographic or a bypass surgery or stenting or anything, uh, after three months, there was dramatic improvement in that area just with plant-based nutrition uh, and smoking cessation. All right, so to sum up, we have a lot of data. Uh, I've given you a lot of things, and there are a few more that you could talk about, animal protein, cholesterol, saturated fat, et cetera, that are bad for you when you're eating animals. Increasing consumption of a plant-based diet, fruit, vegetables, fiber, antioxidants, I would not be able to give you a randomized trial of each individual thing to say why it is that you're getting benefit, but we know it's probably the aggregate of these things are bad versus the aggregate of these being pretty good. Um, and so we do have data on longevity. Uh, we have uh, some prospective data, mostly out of Great Britain, talking about lower morta mortality, particularly in vegans and, and uh, even lacto-ovo vegetarians. It's better if you do it for at least five years. It's better if you start it young. And uh, at the top, my little pun is that I've convinced all of our cardiology fellows to change the spelling of coronary disease so that it spells culinary disease. Okay. All right. All right. So my favorite slide is talking about how first, uh, when I came out and started talking about this, and I had, a, I had already been elected to the presidential team, and they couldn't throw me off. <laughs> and so it was in the New York Times. It went all over, and uh, there was some pushback, mostly the paleo people saying that I was conflicted because of industry. I can't remember. I can't figure out what industry they were talking about. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm in the hell. Oh, I got it. I, I figured out. I just figured out what my conflict of interest is. That is, if people don't die, they keep coming back to clinic and they keep paying the clinic fee. Yes. Okay. All right. That's my financial conflict. I'll have to put that on my slides from now on. 
uh, not death. Okay, <laughs> so, so, um, so yes, it took a little ridicule, took a little violent opposition, but I want to show you a few things that are saying that we may be to the third phase of Schopenhauer's uh, um, triad of, uh, of truth, and that is the dietary guidelines for Americans for 2015 to 2020. After a lot of begging, pleading, cajoling, visits to D.C., going to Bethesda, talking to the, F, to the USDA, Health and Human Services, and the White House, where things can really get done, uh, we actually did, uh, well, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, that was a historical, not a hysterical. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but yes, it was Michelle Obama who had more of an effect on this as I was fighting this. We had them saying that the American College of Cardiology said it's okay to eat eggs in any quantities. It's not what we said, and um, we had to go and fight that, and so we did. And we finally got uh, a healthy vegetarian eating pattern um, into the guidelines for the United States. I'm not going to read it to you just so you know it's there. You can refer to it. You can Google the document. And that thing about dietary cholesterol in eggs, we got them to say the truth, which is, as recommended by the Institute of Medicine, individuals should eat as little dietary cholesterol as possible while consuming a healthy uh, eating pattern. My interpretation of that, as little possible, is zero, and, which means that you're vegan. All right. Um, also being uh, another piece of evidence saying that we're accepted as truth is the fact that we now have major journals, such as the Journal of American College of Cardiology, the number one cardiology journal on the planet, actually has dietary stuff. I was pleased to be a co-author with Andy Freeman, who uh, put this together. It's like herding cats. You've got this whole committee. Ornish is on it. Esselstyn is on it. You've got... Uh, um, some people, there are some paleo people, and the South Beach person, and, you know, so, you know, being, it's not the easiest thing to do, but he somehow, he got it through, um, and he actually has a lot of nutrition information that cardiologists can start to use in their practice. So, uh, at that point, I'm just going to stop and uh, open it up for questions, and, but the first question is always, what is the 6.75? That's the number of vegan cardiologists at Rush University. So. <laughs> so thank you very much.